Okay, so um, without further ado, then Brandon Goodall is, is with Monero's Research Lab. Um, he's going to be presenting on encrypting uh, and comparing anonymous transaction protocols from linkable ring signatures. Brandon has been contributing to the Monero protocol since 2014, and he received his PhD in mathematical sciences from Clemson University in 2017. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I am incredibly grateful for the invitation to come speak today. Um, I'm here to present a new protocol called Triptych. Uh, we'll be explaining the name in a moment here. Um, but before I get into that, I, I didn't really know exactly what sort of audience I was going to be dealing with. So, and this is a very multidisciplinary room. So I started out kind of easy, and then I started running downhill towards the mathematics. And if I lose some of you, I apologize in advance. Um, uh, as, as was just mentioned, my name is Brandon Goodell. Uh, I work pseudonymously under the pseudonym uh, Saray Noether at Monero Research Lab. Um, this is intended to be an honorific uh, for uh, Emma Noether, the mathematician and physicist. Um, Monero is different from Bitcoin. It is a completely different coin. It is not a fork of Bitcoin. It has its own protocol. And I just want to make sure that everybody knows from the beginning that what we're talking about is not a Bitcoin fork, it's not an Ethereum smart contract system, it is its own animal. Um, and the focus of Monero is to try to be private digital cash. And everybody in the world, I think, can appreciate privacy from a really, really high level, like if you're an economist, right, like you don't want, uh, 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 excuse me, I'm sorry, I got distracted. Um, uh, if you have an economy that is being run off of a bank system or a credit card system like Visa or MasterCard, then every single transaction that you make is intermediated with some third party. It's a trusted third party. And this is basically in contradiction with the notion of open society. The idea that I have to go ask permission to go spend my own money from Wells Fargo is probably an a problem with freedom and liberty in general. Um, uh, and the thing is, nobody would be able to censor these transactions or, or tell me what I can do with my money if every single transaction was perfectly encrypted and indistinguishable from a uniform random variable. Okay, so if all of the internet on the, or all of the communication and traffic on the internet was end to end encrypted, then you wouldn't have to worry about things like net neutrality being threatened. You wouldn't have to worry about IBM uh, accidentally leaking their financial secrets to Microsoft. You wouldn't have to worry about hackers down the street taking your, taking your identity from an Equifax leak. Okay? Um, so there's a really great paper called The Case for Electronic Cash by Jerry Brito. Uh, he works at uh, Coin Center, which is an American nonprofit. Um, it's a really, really good paper, and I strongly recommend that everybody read it. Um, so, like I said, Monero is a private cryptocurrency. The goal is to go for privacy in pursuit of human rights. Um, so, we have a couple of principles that underlie everything that we do at Monero, and we run into brick walls a lot when it comes to development because of these principles. One of these principles is Kirchhoff's principle. And of course, all the cryptographers and mathematicians in the room are aware of this. If a system is totally inspectable, if you know exactly how it works and the only thing that you're missing is the private key, then it should still be secure. Right? It's, compare this to like the Enigma machine from World War II. Right? The reason the Enigma machine worked was because nobody really knew exactly how, 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 what it was doing. And then as soon as the method of how the Enigma machine worked was uncovered, everybody able to crack Enigma. And in fact, in most cryptography classes at an undergraduate levels, sometimes, in fact, I had at least one teacher and one of my coworkers likes to give kids the Enigma ciphers and try to get them to crack it. Um, another thing that uh, we run into at Monero is this minimization of required trust. Uh, we've already hit several talks today about trusted third parties and how dangerous they can be. Um, uh, Schemes of trusted setups or certificate authorities or some sort of key registration authority um, or any sort of scheme or setup that has toxic waste, we try to avoid at Monero. Um, and lastly, we really try to focus on permissionlessness. Um, one of the interesting parts about the talks that we had earlier today for uh, the library talks uh, involved this idea that anybody could post 
to this blockchain and, and add a library record. And um, the idea that anybody can post and you don't require any permission to participate, um, this is a really, really great thing, but the only way that you can get to it is to minimize the overall total cost of participation. So these are three principles that I'm gonna sort of touch on as we talk about Triptych today. Um, so before I actually get into Triptych, again, there's a lot of uh, preliminaries here. I wanna make sure that everybody in the room understands how Bitcoin works, okay? This is one of my favorite graphs. I manually made it in LaTeX. Um, so uh, let's say you have two Bitcoin transactions. You can graph out the transaction graph just like this. This graph says, uh, the solid lines, by the way, are the left nodes are keys and the right-hand nodes are signatures. So the solid lines are the keys that signed the signatures. So A signed sigma A and B signed sigma B and so on and so forth. So this, these two tr this graph represents two transactions. We have keys A and B being signed by signatures sigma A and sigma B producing key C, the dashed lines meaning some sort of like output. And then C, D, and E are again being signed, uh, used to construct signatures and being respent creating key F. Okay, and moreover, if you're a third party, if you're you, you can go on to blockchain.info, the sketchiest like block explorer in the world, and you can download any transaction you like from the Bitcoin blockchain, and you can graph this thing out. And you can see exactly which addresses contain how much money, which is super, super not great if you wanna be IBM running a cryptocurrency, right? You don't want to pay a vendor and then have that vendor be able to look at all of your books, right? It's absurd. Um, so this is how Bitcoin works, and the idea behind Monero is to try to take this transaction graph and obscure it, okay? First thing we do is we replace keys with one-time keys, and then the second thing we do is we replace regular signatures with ambiguous signatures. And let me get, get, explain that in a moment. Um, so if we're gonna mask ledgers, there's a bunch of different methods out there. Um, one method is coin join. Uh, this is when you in, participate with a couple of friends to make one transaction, but eight people are constructing those transactions and they're paying seven, six or seven people. You don't know what inputs are going to who. Stuff like that, right? That's what coin join does. Um, Zcash, on the other hand, uses ZK snarks, which is a proving, uh, I don't wanna, misspeak because I get into arguments with these guys all the time. ZK snarks are fantastic authentication structures that can be verified very, very quickly for huge, huge anonymity sets. Um, but they use a trust, trusted setup. And this causes problems with that one principle that we were mentioning at the beginning that we want to minimize trust at Monero. So, um, by the way, there's a couple of term, uh, terms that uh, get thrown around incorrectly, especially on Twitter. Um, a zero-knowledge proving system may or may not have a trusted setup. It may or may not be used to construct a transaction protocol. It may or may not even make claims about your privacy. ZK does not mean magic encryption technology. ZK is a precise term in mathematics that has a very precise meaning, and you have to interpret it context to context. Otherwise, you're just throwing around words like continuous without really knowing what they mean. Um, so, like I said, Monero, on the other hand, uses ring signatures to obscure the transaction graph. And the way ring signatures work, it makes it ambiguous which key constructed which signature. So, in this graph, we have keys A, B, and C are being used to construct this signature sigma, A, B, C. We don't know which key, but one of them was. And uh, then, keys D, E, and F are used to construct sigma D, E, and F. And I don't know which of those D, E, and F are used to construct them. All I know is that one of these were used. And in addition to that, in order to make sure that like, nobody can spend with the same key more than once, they also have to publish these linkability tags, uh, with these fancy math frac TI, T1 and T2. Um, and the way that you prevent double spends is you say, okay, this is supposed to be like a verifiable random function of the key that was actually used to sign this. And this is supposed to be a verifiable random function. And so I should be able to verify that this verifiable random function came from the key that I'm looking for. And if I want to like compare two signatures, all I do is compare these two linkability tags. Okay, so this is how Monero's graphs look. Now, unfortunately, this is not that much harder to trace 
than the previous graph. Um, for those of you guys who know much about graph theory, this graph, um, all of the algorithms that you would use in this graph also apply to this graph, and they're parallelizable, which is a hard word to say sometimes, which means if my graph is much, much bigger, all I need to do is throw more cores at it. So I haven't really improved my situation too much by masking the transaction graph. Unfortunately, that also means that Zcash and these other methods of masking the transaction graphs also inherit all the same problems with tracing. Okay, so even though this is a suboptimal method, it's the best we can do right now. Um, so, the main thing about linkable ring signatures is this linkability tag here, these T's, okay? I need to be able to not know who signed this, but I need to make sure that they never sign anything else, okay? Um, so, quick, a couple of cute, quick facts about current Monado signatures. Our signatures use really small anonymity sets of 11. I have some, some preliminary data that suggests that this is good enough under certain circumstances. Um, our signatures also use no trust setup. Anybody who here who trusts elliptic curve cryptography and, and a hash function can go and use and construct a Monero signature. You don't need to rely on the idea that Zcash actually threw away their toxic waste in order to make a transaction, okay? Um, Unfortunately, and this is where everything really starts to hit the brick wall at velocity, with a small anonymity set, right, of like n members, signature sizes are O of n, and the verification time is O of n. Which means my blockchain is, even if like usage of my blockchain is going to stay constant over the next 10 years, that means I'm going to be increasing linearly the number of keys and the size of that blockchain. There's nothing getting around this. This is awful, okay? 10 years from now, excuse me, if it takes 10 years for me to double my blockchain, then every, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm not gonna go further into that. So, um, again, like I said, we can't improve our verification times um, uh, without some form of succinctness uh, using snarks. Um, but we don't always wanna upgrade our signature schemes. Right now, one of the things we're really concerned with at Monero is making sure that people who are using our technology to protect themselves, for example, perhaps in tyrannical nations, or people who are in an abusive relationship and they want to get away from an abusive partner or something like that, these people who really, really need to protect themselves, um, uh, they, they really need to be sure that the signatures work. <laughs> they don't really care so much about the size of the blockchain. Um, moreover, if somebody just hands me a random scheme that happens to be sublinearly sized, that doesn't mean that I should be implementing it. Um, for one thing, I want to minimize the total barrier to entry to get onto the Monero network. And everybody here who is designing a network should have the exact same goal in mind. Minimize the barrier to entry. And the reason is that if you have a zero cost to enter a system, then you can get a full, complete, representative sample of the population. But if you have even a small cost, let's say a dollar, and a billion people live on a dollar a day, how many people are guaranteed to never even attempt to use your technology? Like a billion people, not worth it. Even a small cost is just not worth it if you're talking about onboarding. So. Um, the way that I have been uh, quantifying the cost to new users for Monero is to look at the total time to download and sync the blockchain. So if it, it's not just that the blockchain is 10 times larger, but if it also takes me 10 times the, to verify it, then it's really just totally unsuitable, right? It's not just download time, it's also verification time. And um, I believe that at least one of the cryptography talks this morning actually listed verification times in a table, and I was very happy to see that because I never see that in any papers. Um, so if download time is proportional to signature size and total sync time is bounded by the sum of the download time and the verification times, it's totally possible that not all sublinear schemes are worth implementing. And here's the first page with any real math in it. Um, and it's not even really math, uh, it's just arithmetic. If a scheme is proposed with logarithmically sized signatures, uh, we want the new cost to be smaller than the old cost, and like I said a few minutes ago, the uh, 
New cost is both down, or both costs are download time plus verification time. Um, but if somebody hands me a logarithmically sized scheme, this guy's going to be logarithmic. And our current scheme is linear. You do some algebra, arithmetic really, and you get to this uh, inequality at the bottom here, which is actually okay news for us, even though it's nasty. You might be able to plug in a real number, or like actual numbers for n to get some actual inequalities here, but you don't really need to. Just take n out to infinity. This term goes to zero. This term goes to zero. We need zero less than a plus delta c, which means a is the amount of time, download time per ring member. Delta C is going to be the change in verification time. So what this says is that if I can improve my verification time more than my total download time, it's worth switching. Okay. So over the past three or four years, we've had several sublinear schemes proposed to us at Monero Research Lab. I think in total now we've had five come across our desk. And uh, three of them satisfy this requirement. One of them is the one I'm presenting today. Okay. So uh, if you go to IACR, the 2020 slash 018 paper, we were really close to being 202020. That would have been great. Um, we present Triptych. Uh, it's a signer ambiguous confidential transaction protocol. So it's a transaction protocol. And it's confidential transactions, so transaction amounts are hidden by Peterson commitments. And it's signer ambiguous because we use linkable ring signatures and you can't really tell which keys sign which. Okay? Um, so we presented Triptych that is a signer ambiguous confidential transaction protocol. It's based on linkable proofs of knowledge of parallel one of many commitment openings by Growth and Colvice. Um, now, this paper by Growth and Colvice has actually given birth to like Maybe uh, I can think of five papers, six papers off the top of my head that have used this scheme. It's fantastic. Um, so I'm just going to describe it really, really briefly. Um, if you have an elliptic curve group, well, actually, just get, suppose any, yeah, elliptic, let's go with elliptic curve group. I don't want to get fancy here. Um, and you have two generators, G and U, uh, then any proving system, this growth Colvice proving system, for example, um, that satisfies, uh, that proves this relationship can be used to construct such a protocol. So what does this relationship say? This says, okay, I have D input commitments and a tag J. These are my new, this is my new linkability tag. Instead of the fancy T, I switch to J. Um, there exists some index, one of these guys, and I know the secret key for that index, MLJ. Moreover, that J happens to be this value right here. Okay. Now it turns out that this value for j, 1 over r times u, right, if you move r over, that's a verifiable random function. Okay. So this goes back to the linkability tags being verifiable random functions. So what does this mean? This means, okay, if you hand me 15 commitments, if I can prove this statement, then it means that I know uh, the opening information for one of those 15 commitments. And if I can prove that, then I can construct a linkable ring signature scheme, and from that I can construct a transaction protocol. Okay. So uh, here's a toy example of how Triptych works. Um, I take my input commitments, which are now pairs. In the previous page, these go out to D, right? The dimension is D. On this page, we're just setting D equal to. This whole toy example is just D equals to. We have two commitments. Okay. So what I, what I want to do is I want to spend W to these guys. So I, I have my W input commitments. This laser pointer is not working not very well. Um, I have these W in, oh, there we go. Nope. We have these W input commitments. Um, I pick an anonymity set. So those are like all of the different, the ABC keys and the DEF keys from that first graph. I pick an anonymity set with the I index and I, take all of my witness information, which are all the keys for the things that I'm actually spending, along with their indices inside of the anonymity set. Um, I compute the linkability tag, and I make some fake commitments to the same amounts that are stored up in this second coordinate here. And when I subtract them off, I can just run that proving system from the previous page, and I can get a separate proof. 
So if I want to spend all W of these guys, I can just spit out all of these proofs pi u. Okay. Now this is such a toy example that this isn't even actually like the, on the next slide. I'm going to show you guys some timing numbers and some size numbers, and this is not the protocol that uses those timing numbers. This is too simple. <laughs> Um, the timing numbers I'm about to show you, you don't need to compute a different proof for each input. It all just takes place in one big go. All right. So this is a nice toy example of kind of how things are supposed to work, um, but the numbers I'm about to show you on the next page aren't, uh, uh, aren't from this. Um, now, the reason it's called triptych, I promised that I would get back to that, is because what we end up doing is we end up proving a statement about the m's, a statement about the j's, and a statement about the pi's. So you have eh, eh, eh. Okay. Um, so for this to be a, a transaction protocol, the spender has to add some extra information. Um, for example, if you're going to spend some keys, then you need to make new keys so that the next person can spend the stuff that they received. Right? So we need these output commitments, qj. Um, moreover, uh, they all need to, like, add up to be zero so that I'm not creating more money than I'm destroying, right? These are my fake input commitments. These are my real output commitments. If they equal each other, then they have to have the same amounts. Um, keeping in mind that I selected really carefully the masks for these commitments so that they would match. Okay. Um, so the full approach integrates proof of amount balance, so I don't need these P prime U's that are these dummy commitments. Um, and it, it's a lot faster than this example. So, man, I, I thought I was on s the timing slide already. I'm way ahead of myself. So um, signature sizes for triptych currently, this graph is a little bit misleading. Um, so current signatures in Monero are very similar to this top line, except they're much, much bigger. And not only that, they can't be batched or made better or faster. Okay, this CLSAG talk line is a paper that, I'm, that we are currently writing um, that is cutting signature sizes about asymptotically in half. And it's improving verification time moderately. And there's some other cool stuff that you can do with CLSAG. Now, uh, like I mentioned earlier, there have been several uh, schemes, sublinear schemes that have come out recently. One of them is Ring CT 3.0 which came out, uh, I, I believe, by one of the original authors of linkable ring signatures, um, the, uh, Lee, or Lu, excuse me, um, from the Lu, Wei, and Wong paper from 2004. Uh, and so we compare it, compare triptych to ring CT3. And you can see that the signature sizes are competitive, basically across all orders of magnitude. If you're familiar with ring signatures at all, you know that like a lot of ring members than 10 or 15 is real slow to verify. So we're very unlikely, generally, to find ourselves out here where uh, Triptych actually starts beating ring CT3. But this is like a whole order of magnitude. This is two orders of magnitude across which they're pretty competitive. Okay. So in terms of signature size, it's not too different from uh, the schemes that we see uh, today. Um, so what about timing, though? And this is the real value of triptych. The triptych transactions can be batched. So if I download the whole blockchain and I want to verify, I can verify block by block instead of transaction by transaction. And that brings things down significantly. So um, on a single 2 gigahertz core, and I looked it up because I was curious, the first 2 gigahertz core came out, I believe, by Intel about a week and a half before 9-11 in 2001. So this is not like a speedy core that we're talking about, OK? Um, this thing, uh, our timing for Triptych and Ring CT, uh, by the way, the timing for Ring CT on this involves stripping a whole lot of things out of Ring CT so that we can do an apples to apples comparison, because the original Ring CT is the full transaction protocol involving range proofs and such. Are, uh, but in order to compare to the triptych linkable ring signatures, we had to rip a bunch of that stuff out and just compare it. Um, what we end up with is anonymity set sizes of like 512 at, for triptych. They take like not even three kilobytes, and they can be batch verified 
for example, in batches of 128 at 42.2 milliseconds per. Um, now, comparable ring CT transaction is a little bit smaller, takes a little bit more time to verify. The main thing is that these ring CT guys have to be padded with a bunch of dummy inputs. And so even though these look competitive, um, there's a lot of waste that goes on with verifying ring CT 3.0 that isn't necessary with triptych. Um, also, uh, just for reference, let's see if it's on the next page. Do I have another page? Nope. I only have 15 slides. Um, for reference, we currently use, our current ring signatures use uh, ring size 11. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and it takes around 13 milliseconds on this exact same core to verify one of those signatures. So going from like 11 ring members at 13 milliseconds, 500 ring members, 40 milliseconds, that's a really good improvement. And such a nice improvement that it'll make it so that a year from now after we've implemented Triptych, it'll actually take less time for people to get onto the Monero network than it will if we had After, I think, only six months using Triptych, we're going to be shaving a couple hours off of download and sync time. And that's only after six months. So after three or four years, we're talking about saving a month or two months of sync time. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, yeah, so just to recap, Monero is a private cryptocurrency. Our main goal is decentralization, private digital cash. This leads us to be an open source project I'm one of many contributors at the project, um, but I'm one of the only paid folks. Uh, and uh, we don't really have like a hierarchical organization or structure. We do all of this out of the goodness of our hearts, so to speak, to try to contribute to privacy technology. Um, we've been struggling to break through the sublinear barrier at Monero for a couple of years now, specifically because uh, not all the sublinear schemes that have come out are even worth implementing. Um, but now we have, actually, I think there's another proposal also on the table that we're, we're balancing. And so sometime in the next three to six months, we're going to be switching over to sublinear ring signatures for Monero. We're going to be seeing ring sizes increase dramatically. That's it. They are selected ad hoc from current keys that are sitting on the blockchain. So if I, I, I'll I'll go select um, at random ten or fifteen ring or ten ring members to mix with my one output from the blockchain. Um, there is a lot of debate and discussion about how to select those ring members. Um, cryptographers, in particular, mathematicians like to select things uniformly, but economic spending habits are not uniform over time. And so, in fact, most outputs that are being spent, if you look at the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, have been spent recently, like in the past day, day and a half. Um, so if you select uniformly from the entire history of Monero's blockchain, then most of your selections are going to be ancient. And one of those selections will be new, and that's very likely to be your output. And this is called the guess first heuristic. Um, so there's a big discussion about which distribution we should be selecting from to include as ring members, specifically because the density of outputs on the blockchain is dependent on economic information. A depression is when people start spending slower and slower, and a boom is when people start spending faster and faster. And so selecting from a single distribution for ring members based on age alone is an inappropriate thing that's sensitive to economic indicators. Correct. One of the problems that we fear would be a so-called poison pill attack, where some third party just floods the Monero blockchain with as many outputs as they like, and then they can see which members are theirs and which ring members aren't. Um, there's really no way to prevent that right now, unfortunately. Yes, sir. There's an expression in law enforcement, uh, if they're investigating a crime, to follow the cash. 
uh, and uh, law enforcement has forensic auditors or law enforcement individuals that want to follow the cash. Uh, your system here obfuse up these uh, signatures. Can you compare the effect? Of, so, uh, assume I'm a forensic auditor. Okay, can I find the bad guys with your system or Bitcoin? And how, how would that work? Uh, so, let's say you're a forensic. Uh, let's just say you're an auditor. I don't know about forensic. Let's say you work for the IRS. You contact me. Um, you want to audit my wallet because something's suspicious about my taxes. Monero admits something called a view key, which allows you allows an auditor to see all of the incoming transactions to one of your wallets. So um, we currently don't have outgoing view key cap capacity, although there's currently a discussion about that. Is that no, it is in fact a specific. Okay, so the way that Monero works is these one-time keys are generated, and if you have the view key you can tell whether or not the one-time key belongs to that key or not. But if you don't have the view key, you can't tell, and you can't find the secret key either way, uh, unless you have all of the keys. So in a certain sense, it's, it's, a view on, it's very much a view-only key. Yes, sir. Oh. Um, we, the short answer is I do not. I know that there are several work groups who are monitoring traffic who come onto the Monero network regularly. Um, those of you who have heard about Monero, unfortunately, may have heard about it in context with North Korean miners. Um, there's, there's, uh, it's apparently there's an IP address in North Korea that really, really likes mining Monero. Um, <laughs> my understanding is, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. So right now, the Monero project is working on. Um, there, there's a work group called Covery, which uh, Monero is Esperanto for money, and Covery is Esperanto for cover. Um, the idea of Covery is to be an I2P or a Tor-like networking layer specifically to take to, to remove the advantage from extra networking information that's been revealed. But it's not currently, as far as I know, I don't know the pro status of that project. But I know that there's an archival network uh, program that Insight Data Science is running in San Francisco. They do nothing but archive everything that happens on the Monero network, and that includes nodes hopping on, hopping off, and so on and so forth. So um, somebody out there is watching, and I know that Chainalysis is watching, because I would be. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so my question is regarding the compliance side or the standardized side. Uh, does Nisto or Pisma have any kind of opinion? Um, not that I know of. The, the short answer is standardization right now for transaction protocols in general, as far as I know, just doesn't happen. Um, I, I know that there are some discussions about trying to take something like a decentralized eCash protocol and standardizing it, um, but I haven't been part of those discussions at all. And yeah, yes, sir. How do you get enough to go past early adopters? I'm a mathematician. That's why I have to go. What is my message? Is it the Pythagorean theorem? So, fundamental theorem of algebra. I'm in a troubled situation, and I need to uh, uh, be able to. Uh, I need to be able to store some cash. I get. I can do that. How do I get that to my, the housewives or the uh, uh, third world countries? Um, so there's a really popular thing in the cryptocurrency industry, and maybe some of you have noticed this. But somebody will come up to you and they'll be like, "Oh, I came up with this biological authentication method so that." women in abusive relationships can store their money in a way that's hidden from their husbands and only they can access it. And then you say something like, so what biometric are you using? And they say something like, oh, irises or droplet of blood. And I'm like, those are both things that the husband has access to regularly, especially if he is a particularly abusive guy. So um, as far as... Uh, what it means to actually get this sort of technology in the hands of people it can help, that is a problem for the open society, right? Like that's, that's like a problem as old as democracy. I have no idea how to answer that question. And a follow-up question. Interdisciplinary research teams, right? Yeah. Some social scientists, some anthropology people, some psychologists, some psychiatrists, 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 some psychi
Yeah. Follow-up question, where is your headquarters? Where is the um, not-for-profit company's headquarters located? We don't have a not-for-profit company. Um, I run a not-for-profit not called Multidisciplinary Academic Grants and Cryptocurrencies, um, but no, Monero doesn't have any legal entity behind it at all. We are a bill. Not-for-profit that you run, where is that located? Uh, that's located in Colorado. Magic. It's a good name for a nonprofit, right? <laughs> I'm actually standing down and I'm handing it off to somebody else, but um, yeah. Any other questions? I know I speak very quickly, and I apologize if I lost any of you. Well, uh, there's no other questions. Let's continue the discussions outside of coffee. So thank you again to all our speakers.